Uh, today, we have two briefings. Uh, we're going to be hearing from the universities at Shady Grove, and then we're going to be receiving our local fiscal briefing from the Department of Legislative Services. And I think all of our special guests from the universities at Shady Grove are, look like they're all together in, in one room, perhaps back in, in Montgomery County. And we'll, we'll start off with you all, and I'll turn it over to you for whatever remarks that you have. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Delegate Polakovich Carr, and good morning, all the members of the delegation. I'm Ann Kadimi, and I'm the executive director here at the universities at Shady Grove. And we have, you can see on the screen there, um, our marketing uh, and communications director, Steve Simon, is there with a room full of our fabulous students from the universities at Shady Grove. I'm going to ask all of them to introduce themselves, but I wanted to just say a few brief words about uh, the legislation that is um, in uh, it, it, bubbling around Annapolis right now for the universities at Shady Grove, and to extend our thanks to all of you for your co-sponsorship and support of the designation request for Shady Grove to be designated the State Regional Higher Education Center um, uh, uh, Community of Innovation. So we thank you all for that. Uh, we're very um, hopeful that that will pass. Uh, the legislation sponsored in the Senate by Senator Nancy King has uh, gone through all of the processes, uh, has gone through the uh, Committee for um, Education and the en Energy and the Environment, and um, is now with the Appropriations Committee in the House, and is being uh, the sponsorship there is being led by Delegate Sarah Wallach. So our sincere thanks to uh, Senator King and to Delegate Wallach for leading that effort, and again to all of you for your support uh, for this uh, designation. We are really excited about this designation because it is the culmination of several years of strategic planning and work and efforts to restructure how we do things here at Shady Grove so that Shady Grove can truly realize its potential as an asset to the University System of Maryland and to the state of Maryland, uh, bringing nine university partners together to focus intently on building pathways for all students that lead to great careers. And uh, we're excited about the designation, uh, lifting up that work, um, hopefully also being a reason to resource Shady Grove in doing this work and being a, a place of innovation and um, testing out new ideas for how to make the pathway experience from transfer to finances, everything smoother for all students in Maryland as well. Um, so with that, again, thank you all for your support. Um, we, hope, we hope this works through the Appropriations Committee and makes it through the House. And we hope to be celebrating the designation of Shady Grove as a community of innovation soon. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Steve and to all the students there. Hello, everyone. And uh, <laughs> nice to see you all. Bright and, bright and early start as well. Oh, yeah. I want to mention, too, that we have not only our wonderful undergraduate students, but we have a number of graduate graduate students represented today too in Annapolis. And this is really important because not only is Shady Grove this innovative model of two plus two for undergraduate students, two years in community college, two years at Shady Grove, but it's also a growing place of interest and support for graduate students, people pursuing their degrees post undergrad. And so I'm grateful to all of you for being there, grateful to the undergrad and the graduate students. Um, please recognize how important this is because Shady Grove is all about lifelong learning and the student's journey across the pathway, which is not only a great undergraduate experience, but graduate and continuing professional education experience as well. So just wanna lift that up. That's gonna be a key source of growth and of workforce development opportunities at Shady Grove. So with that, Steve, I'll hand it over to you and all our wonderful students. Oh, we can't hear you, Steve. Yeah, I think someone's coming to help. There's IT support there. How about now? Can you hear us now? Woo! Sorry. Yes. Uh, awesome. Once again, um, thank you. And sorry about that interruption. Um, we are uh, 
We are here at our other home at the University System of Maryland's uh, Annapolis office, and they uh, set everything up for us. I think I just had one extra button to push. Uh, I'm Steve Simon. I'm the Marketing and Communications Director at USG, but who you really want to hear from today uh, are these wonderful students who are here from different universities. I'm going to ask each of them to give you a, a little introduction and so you can get a sense of the different types of programs that are at USG. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Fatsa Shrestha. I'm currently a junior studying information science at University of Maryland College Park at University of Shady Grove. Good morning. My name is Erica Black. I, my undergraduate degree, I attend to University of Maryland at the Shady Grove, and I am a master program. Uh, University Baltimore Forensic Investigation at the University Shady Grove. So I really miss my community, so I returned with my master's degree to Shady Grove. Hi, I'm Sarah Phillip, and I'm completing a master's in pharmaceutical sciences in uh, UMB, and I take all my classes at the universities at Shady Grove. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Meryl, and I'm completing a bachelor's degree in translational life science and technology at the University of uh, uh, University of Maryland, uh, Baltimore County, but at the University of Shady Grove campus. Um, I'm a management student at the Smith School of Business at UMD um, at the Universities of Shady Grove, and we appreciate your support of the Universities of Shady Grove. And your name. Oh, Eva O'Hara. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Anthony Aquera. I'm also a sub management student completing at the University of University of Maryland College Park Smith School of Business at the University of Shady Grove. Thank you. Greetings. My name is Melanie Julian. I'm a graduate student at University of Maryland Baltimore, Medical Cannabis Science and Therapeutics. So they got to it a little quick. If it's okay, I'd like to ask them to really quick, just give you a sense of why it's important for them that there is a universities at Shady Grove. They made their decision to study from their different university programs at the USG campus. Maybe let me just have you just, they, they only have a couple of minutes, but let's go back around and make sure you fill that in. Um, I feel it's important because first of all, Montgomery County doesn't have a university within the county. So if people want to stay within the county, they have to travel out of the country to go to college and maybe move there and they might be separate from family. So I think it gives you, gives students an opportunity to stay at home and then study. Also, yes, she has uh, more financial aid if students are struggling. And also there is ACES support if you're a part of ACES program, which is achieving the collegiate and success. So there's that as well and a part of it. So yeah, that's about it. I choose the University Shaded Grove campus over to a main campus because it's close to my my house. It's only 10 minutes. I don't have to travel to University of Maryland College Park or traveling to Baltimore, which is two hours. Also, as a smaller classroom, same professor, great environment, great committee, and uh, and I just uh, love to be studying there. Uh, and uh, I think I chose the universities at Shady Grove because the, the county is really an epicenter for the pharmaceutical industry mm -hmm. and it gives us a huge boost as students that are located here to get many opportunities. So fingers crossed for that. Um, I also chose universities of Shady Grove because one, it is closer to my home and I, I'm a homebody. So I like to stay <laughs> home and I like to be close to my family. But at the same time, being in the biotechnology field, um, where University of Shady Grove is located, it is an epicenter for a lot of biotechnology uh, company. So I feel like for me, it's a way to network myself among company and University of Shady Grove. They have a lot of opportunity for me to develop in my career as well, and also a lot of scholarship and financial aid. So that's why I chose University of Shady Grove. Yeah, um, I relate to that. I think that it was way more accessible in terms of like pricing and location because I didn't have my license. And so it was like a really easy choice. And also in terms of the Smith School is known for their really high caliber professors. And if I were to go to main campus, I would be in a class with like upwards of 100 people. And at USG, I'm in a cohort of like 18, like 20 people. And so that's like a huge opportunity. So it really wasn't a hard choice for me at all. 
I also have the same uh, thoughts when it comes to the class sizes and the fact that we get the same professors, so we would have a better experience that we would get on College Park anyway because you have a more personal, personalized experience. And I also have, I live with family around there, and it was definitely a better option than having to either commute to College Park every day or stay there because I'm more of a family-orientated person anyway. And also the fact that, again, the community, I actually did spend a semester on College Park, and the community was just so much better and more welcoming when I went to Shady Grove versus the College Park main campus. And the medical cannabis science and therapeutics program is primarily online. We do meet twice a year at the Shady Grove campus, which is very convenient. We have students in our program from all over the country and also international students as well. So it's also very convenient for the local people to not have to drive all the way out to Baltimore. So we enjoy that. There you are, we'll give it back to the chair. <laughs> Well, thank you all. And I have to say to all the students, you're very effective advocates. And I love that you have like your elevator pitches like down and you've nailed those. So great job, everyone. And uh, before we open it up for questions and colleagues, if anyone has any questions, uh, please raise your virtual hand. I'll just give a shout out to Dr. Kadimian for her great op-ed in Maryland Matters. I think that was earlier this week. This week has felt like an eternity, but I think it was just a few days ago that was that was published in Maryland Matters. If folks haven't checked that out yet. So colleagues, any any questions this morning? Not seeing any hands go up. Oh, Delegate Kaufman, I see you're unmuted. Did you have a question? I do not. I just forgot to mute myself. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. No worries. I just wanted to make sure everyone had an opportunity. Yes, Delegate Spiegel. Good morning, and uh, thanks to all of the students for your, your excellent presentation and uh, uh, the faculty as well. Uh, I was wondering, just curious, if any of you were involved when... Uh, the television show about uh, the, the campus road trip came to campus. Uh, as I understand it, they talked about um, sort of informally it being the most innovative uh, institution that they had visited um, in the entire sort of history of the television show. Well, I'm going to take that. Thank you, Delegate Spiegel, for a good question there. Yes, if you, we will make sure that all of you have a chance to see the TV show he's talking about, it's called The College Tour. It's a national show, and they just did a 30-minute episode about USG. And to your question about the students, there's one who is who is literally waiting at the uh, for the shuttle, and she was coming separately. Uh, she's parked up at Naval Academy, had to meet us up here. She is one of the students, uh, Anastasio, if you see the show. Uh, and she actually testified uh, earlier on... Uh, at the Senate hearing uh, on the, the Community of Innovation Bill. So she's actually been up here in Annapolis and she had to go to class uh, later today. So she's arriving separately. So she is one of the 10, but there are 10 students featured um, in that show and she is one of the 10. We look There's forward to watching that. Delegate Wallach. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Not a question, but just um, wanted to, to say thank you for the advocacy and uh, all the work that um, you know, Director, Executive Director Kadimian has done uh, over the last a couple months, uh, actually years you've been working on implementing. I think what um, folks may or may not know is that USG has been working on actualizing the strategic plan for us figuring out how to actually create this community of innovation, um, but then how to make it come alive. Uh, by hiring the right folks, creating these pods. It's very complex and really thought out. Um, so I just commend you for all your work on making this vision come to life. And then all of the students for, um, for coming on and, and advocating as well. So I look forward to seeing all of you um, today in Annapolis. Thank you. All right, seeing no further hands, uh, again, we, we thank you all. Oh, yes, Delegate Wims. I had my hand up and it went. I know time is short, but I just want to say thank you to the students and thank you to the leadership at USG. I served on the board there for three years, and I'm just so proud of how the uh, University of Shady Grove has grown. So thank you all, staff and students. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Wims. And, and Dr. Kadimian, did you have any closing remarks? 
I just want to, again, thank you all. Thanks to our wonderful students for their advocacy today and for just, you know, the, the incredible work they put in to be successful here at Shady Grove. I also want to recognize, in addition to Steve, who's leading the team, we have a number of our other staff members who are key to student support there. I see Annie Foster Ahmed. I see Karen Sue. I'm not sure if... Um, uh, if Shelby's there as well, but I just want to call out our other staff members who made the trip. Shelby too. and David and student affairs. Okay, terrific, terrific. There we go. So thank you all so much. And again, thank you, Delegate Polakovich Carr and all members of the delegation for okay. this opportunity and to Delegate Woolock for her support, especially for the legislation. So thank you all. Thank you. And so next we will turn to uh, our uh, local fiscal briefing. We have Hiram Birch here from the Department of Legislative Services who will be briefing us this morning. Well, actually our state A team comprised of Arnold Aja and Valerie Monroe will be hitting off the presentation today. So I'll turn it over to Arnold. Good morning, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Arnold Aja. I'm here with Valerie Monroe and Hiram Birch. Hiram is here to support us and uh, for any questions that you may have. I would like to share my screen. Before we begin, I just want to stress that the numbers we'll be presenting on reflect the governor's allowance. Uh, starting on page one of the report, this page shows you the magnitude of the state aid to local governments. It is around one third of general funds and one fourth of total state funds. In comparison, you can see that entitlements account for 20% of general funds and around 15% of state funds. And uh, funding for state agencies represents around 45% of general funds and 55% of all state funds. On page four, you can see that Montgomery County will receive $1.3 billion in state aid in fiscal 2025, $1.1 billion is direct aid, and $206.3 million is for retirement payments. Total state aid increases by 8.4% over the prior year. You can see that the public school system receives the majority of this funding at $979 million, which is over 87% of the total state aid provided to the county. The county will receive $70.7 .7 million in county and municipal aid. The local library aid totals $3.9 million and state funding from Montgomery College totals $72.5 million. The Senate recently adopted their budget plan, which includes two major differences from the governor's allowance, and those will have an impact on the aid provided to Montgomery County, specifically the aid to the Montgomery College and the police enhancement funding. Uh, we will discuss these two uh, major changes in, in detail at the end of the presentation. On page six, you can see the dollar difference over the prior year. You can see that total state aid to Montgomery County increases by around $103.9 million. Aid to the public school system increases by $38.8 million. The county and municipal aid increases by $30.2 million. And the county and municipal aid increase is primarily driven by the bus rapid transit grant. State funding for Montgomery College will decrease by $2.9 million and the Budget and Reconciliation and Financing Act includes a provision that rebases the K funding formula, and this reduces statewide funding for community colleges by $22.6 million. In Montgomery County, the project projected reduction in the K fund funding formula totals around $3 million. We will now go over uh, some of the county and municipal aid programs. On page 12, you can see the existing police aid formula, which will total $15.9 million in fiscal 2025. Page 13 shows you the factors affecting the police aid formula, primarily your 
population density, which accounts for 75% of this funding. Page 14 shows you the police aid enhancement funding, which will total $3.6 million. And this funding is based on the total number of violent crime offenses occurring within the county. Page 17 shows you the funding trend for the fire and rescue aid program. And Montgomery County will receive $1.9 million in fiscal 2025. On page 18, you, you can see that the this funding is based on each jurisdiction's share of property tax accounts relative to the statewide total. On page 19, uh, you can see that Montgomery County will receive $5.7 million in local health grants. On page 12, you can see uh, the highway user revenues funding trend. Montgomery County will receive $21.8 million in fiscal 2025. Page 23 shows you the county and municipal share of the highway user revenues, which is based on road mileage and uh, vehicle registration. The county government will receive $12.7 million and the municipalities will receive $9.1 million. Moving back to page 20, this page details some key points, the funding history of the highway user revenues program and the distribution through the next fiscal years. As you can see on the table to your left side, um, however, the BRFA includes provisions that would revert funding back to fiscal year 2024 levels beginning in fiscal year 2026. And this would result in a $5.5 million reduction in funding from Montgomery County in fiscal 2026 and fiscal 2027. And Montgomery County will also receive $27 million for bus rapid transit in fiscal 2025. I will now turn it over to Valerie who will present on the education aid. Thank you, Arno. Good morning, Chair, and to the Montgomery County House Delegation. On page 30, you will observe that the vast majority of state funding is targeted to the public school system. Direct state aid to the Montgomery County public school system accounts for 73.2% of total state aid provided to the county, and funding for teacher retirement accounts for 14.4% of total state aid. On the same page, you would see that the Montgomery County public school system will receive 979 million indirect aid which represents a 38.8 million or 4.1% increase from the prior year. In addition, the state will provide 192.2 million in funding for teacher retirement payments. On a per pupil basis, Montgomery County will receive 7,583 in-state funding, 6,339 per pupil indirect aid, and 1,244 per pupil for teacher retirement payments. Page 32 shows that Montgomery County will receive a 4.8% increase in per pupil direct aid in fiscal 25. This actually exceeds the statewide average increase of 3.2%. Montgomery County ranks fifth in the amount of per pupil direct aid increase. We'll now turn our attention to blueprint and targeted funding on page 35. Montgomery County will receive 39 million in-state funding under the blueprint initiatives in fiscal 25. This includes 3.3 million for supplemental instruction, 17.9 million in concentration of poverty grants, 7.3 million for full day pre-kindergarten, and 2.2 million for college and career programs. On page, 30, page 36, you will observe that a considerable amount of state education funding is based on targeted student populations, 
with Montgomery County receiving $394.8 million in targeted grants under the compensatory aid, English language learners, and special education programs. Of these three programs, Montgomery County received $202 million in compensatory aid funding, $79 million in special education funding, and $113.7 million in English language learners. We now turn our attention to student enrollment on page 45. The full-time equivalent student enrollment count decreases by 0.7% in Montgomery County. In comparison, the statewide average full-time equivalent student enrollment count increases by 0.1%. Currently, the county school system has around 154,500 public school students, which accounts for 18.1% of students statewide. Page 46 shows the number of students approved for the free and reduced price meals, which increases by 0.2% in Montgomery County, and this is below the statewide average increase of 1.3%. Montgomery County currently has a below average percentage of students approved for the free and reduced price meal at 43.3% of total student enrollment. It is important to note that statewide, over half of the students are approved for the free and reduced price meal, and this ranges from around 27% in Carroll County to almost 90% in Dorchester County and Baltimore City. Page 47 shows that Montgomery County has the second highest percentage of students identified as English language learners at 20.5%, of total student enrollment. In fiscal 25, the number of English language learner students increases by 4.8%, resulting in 1,456 additional students requiring language services. The annual percent increase in the number of English language learner students is below the statewide average of 6.1%. On page 48, you will see that Montgomery County has an above average share of students receiving special education services at 14.7% of total enrollment. This compares to the statewide average of 13.9%. If we can go back to page 37, this shows the factors affecting targeted education funding. The targeted student index measures the percent share of a school's system student enrollment approved for the free and reduced price meal, English language learners, and special education services. While Montgomery County has an average targeted student index of 78.5%, a significant portion of the county's public, public school students has been identified as needing additional education services to meet academic performance standards. The targeted student index ranges from 42.3% in Carroll County to 117.4% in Baltimore City with a statewide average at 78.3%. And finally, on page 50, this shows us that statewide, public school enrollment represents 13.9% of the total state population. In Montgomery County, Public school enrollment represents 14.7% of the overall county population, and this is actually the sixth highest share in the state. In comparison, Kent County has the lowest share, with public school enrollment accounting for 8.4% of the total county population, while Howard County has the highest share at 16.7%. Again, I want to thank you for your time, and I'll now turn it back over to Arnold, and he will show you where you can find our state aid resources on our website. Thank you. Well, first, I'd like to expound on the two major changes that under the state plan that will have an effect on Montgomery County's aid. The first adjustment is a change that rebases the CAID funding formula for community colleges and results in a smaller reduction compared to the governor's allowance. Under the Senate plan, the county will experience a $1.2 million reduction in the CAID funding formula over the prior year, compared to a $3 million 
reduction under the governor's plan. As you can see, this is a $1.8 million uh, upswing uh, from Montgomery County. Uh, the second adjustment is a $5 million, $5 million statewide reduction for the police aid enhancement program from $50.9 million to $45.9 million. And under the Senate plan, Montgomery County will receive $3.3 million, which is around $300,000 less than under the governor's plan. However, the $5 million from the reduction are being re repurposed for other initiatives approved by the General Assembly in previous sessions. $4 million is earmarked for police accountability and $1 million is for warrants and absconding. Uh, the, basically, the Senate plan would fully fund these two programs. Now, I'd like to briefly show you how you can access our uh, state aid resources. From the Maryland General Assembly website, click on the Legislative Services tab to the top right corner. Uh, once on our main page, you would click on the Budget tab followed by the state aid to local governments sub tab. And again, this reflects the governor's allowance. Uh, we will update these uh, numbers um, for the legislative appropriation. Under session reports, you have access to two year charts by government entity and two year charts by program. You could access uh, program specific to Montgomery uh, County. Under session reports, we have the state aid overview report, which we just presented on. And we also prepared uh, some summary, four page uh, summary reports uh, for the counties. So you can access uh, for Montgomery County as well. Under highlighted, you have the ability to download state aid data in Excel format. And uh, also want to show you how you can access some of our local government and finances reports. And those are located in another area of our website. So for that, you would have to click on the policy areas tab, followed by the intergovernmental sub tab. I uh, just briefly want to discuss two uh, reports. We recently updated the local government overview report. Uh, this is a very uh, extensive report that has various information on demographics, local government finances, tax rates. And this year we just uh, prepared uh, some exhibits on public school funding. And also under our annual reports, uh, I just wanna highlight the county revenue outlook. And this report uh, will provide information on the revenue attainment from the major uh, taxes and uh cool that would be it and i'd like to open it up for any questions that you may have well thank you so much arnold and valerie and Hiram, for this very uh, informative presentation you always are a wealth of knowledge when you come before the delegation uh every year let's start with delegate kaufman with questions yes thank you arnold and valerie and Hiram. i echo that um and I was just wondering, um, the uh, Board of Revenue Estimates just recently released a two hundred and fifty-five thousand dollar write down in um, in state budget project uh, in you know because income tax gross income tax receipts and things like that. So I was just wondering if you'd been able to break it down into how that revenue write down might impact Montgomery County and the aid that it receives from the state. Okay, um, but currently, the based on the budget as introduced, the only two major changes that the, as Arnold indicated, for the Budget and Taxation Committee was an actually increase in funding under the Community College Cade formula. The budget plan that the Senate has adopted does, does not take as much of a reduction. So right now, based on the current write-down, it's very limited impact right now on state aid to Montgomery County. Um, some of the major factors that is affecting state aid to Montgomery County was done prior to the write-down. 
as the funding for FY26 and FY27 for local highway user revenues. That is being scaled back to, as Arnold indicated, back to the FY24 um, funding levels, which is around a uh, $5 million, it's a $5.5 .5 million reduction that the county will see in FY26 and FY27. But right now, um, we don't really see any major reductions to state aid um, to Montgomery County. Thank and, you. As, as, and also, as Valerie indicated, the vast majority of the state funding that goes to Montgomery County is for public school funding. It's around over 88%. And I think you have heard from both committees that fully funding education is a key priority. And as this year, there was no reductions either in the BRFA or in the Senate plan to reduce funding for public school aid. So. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Kaufman, for that question and for the answer. Um, I do have a, a quick question, Arnold. I think this was in the part of the presentation that uh, you gave about uh, bus rapid transit BRT funding for the county, and I just wanted to get a clarification, and I may have missed this, and my apologies. Uh, the funding increase that you mentioned, um, what was that number again? And I'm wondering if that was reflective of, like, our, our BRT grants from the state actually were, were not awarded last year, and I think that might be a two-year increase. If you could just clarify on on that piece. The county will receive $27 million. So I think when I mentioned the, the $30.2 million increase in county and municipal aid, um, that was uh, that program was part of that, of that increase. Right. I think what happened was in FY23, Montgomery County received funding for bus for the bus rapid transit, and the funding was not provided in 24 but then the funding was restored in 25. So that's basically is a, it shows a $27 million increase, but it's from a $0 amount. So okay. you basically you got funded in 23, the funding was not there in 24 and it's being fully funded again in 25. Thank you. Thank you both for that clarification. Uh, Delegate Solomon. Thanks, Madam Chair. And thank you for the presentation. Um, just a quick question on the community college piece. Um, so I know this wouldn't be directly reflected in the Cade formula, but last year we um, we redid the way that uh, the Promise scholarships are given, um, and we pushed them out to the community colleges, and it resulted in a pretty sizable increase of, I think, under a million, but in financial aid available for Montgomery College. Is that reflected anywhere as as sort of increased aid to community colleges? No, that is not. That's not considered um, state aid, the scholarship money. So that won't be incorporated into these numbers. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Delegate Solomon. Colleagues, any other questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands go up. Uh, again, we'll thank uh, the folks from DLS for this great presentation. We are very appreciative of the information. Uh, and to my colleagues in Montgomery County, I'll say this is our last regularly scheduled uh, House delegation meeting uh, for the time being. We have gotten through all of the work that uh, we needed to get through for this session. If anything comes up and we need to meet um, on a shorter notice, we'll certainly let you know. But for now, I think we have uh, reasonably concluded our, our work here uh, just in the nick of time before crossover. So thank you all for, for your hard work. We definitely also want to thank um, all of our committee counsel, Jen Young, who's on here today, as well as the others who support us in our committees, uh, our House Delegation Administrator, Ralph Costas, and our intern from this session, Jonathan Gonzalez, uh, for all of their hard work. Um, but I think with that, we are adjourned for today. Thank you.